We're very pleased to have uh, Omar Montasser from uh, TTIC uh, to uh, speak today about adversarially robust learnability, uh, characterization and reductions. Uh, Omar is a PhD student at TTIC with a Nati Cerebro uh, and has been doing a, a quite a bit of work on learning uh, the theory of machine learning, adversarial examples, uh, etc. What he's going to Tell us about today is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, conjunction of two works. Uh, one of them that got the best paper award uh, at Colt uh, 2019, and the second that is very recent. Um, and yeah, pretty thrilled to to hear about this. Uh, before we do, I just want to uh, mention two things. First of all, thank uh, the other organizers um, that work behind the scenes. So Anindya De, Sumega Garg, Gautam Kamath, Ilya Rosenstein, Nodad Regev. Uh, Tzeli Schramm, Thomas Vedic, and uh, Eric van Voengarden. Um, and also uh, next week we will have a talk by Shalef Ben David from uh, University of Waterloo on forecasting algorithms, uh, minimax theorems, and randomized lower bounds. And uh, as a last thing before I give you the floor, uh, Omar, uh, if you want to suggest a talk or give us some feedback, etc., we have a form on our website. Uh, that you can go to and suggest talks that would be for the next season or just give us general feedback on anything you, you might want. Um, yeah. Without further ado, uh, please, Omar. Hello, uh, thank you. I would like to first thank the organizers for inviting me and I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, today I'll uh, tell you about uh, some work that I've been doing on adversarially robust learning. And this is joint work with amazing collaborators, uh, Steve Henneke and my advisor, Nadi Srebro. Um, so let's just get started. Uh, probably all of you by now have heard of adversarial examples. Uh, it was shown basically that deep learning predictors are extremely fragile to tiny perturbations. Uh, take, for example, this tabby cat. Uh, originally, the neural network thinks it's a classifies it correctly as a tabby cat. But then if we uh, add a tiny uh, perturbation by just changing a few pixels in the image, uh, suddenly uh, the neural net thinks that this is a guacamole and it's extremely confident that it's a guacamole. So this phenomena of adversarial examples is extremely intriguing in particular, like why are uh, predictors uh, brittle to such tiny perturbations? Like we as humans, we would think that like visually for us, I don't think any of us would distinguish the, the difference between the two images on the left and on the right. And so why is it that the neural net suddenly makes a mistake when we just add this uh, tiny perturbation? Uh, there are also real world concerns for adversarial examples, uh, like researchers have shown that we can take traffic signs and put uh, stickers on them with specific patterns. And suddenly we can fool uh, self-driving systems into thinking uh, that this like traffic sign is, is some other traffic sign. Uh, uh, researchers have shown also that we can fool uh, face recognition systems by uh, wearing glasses with specific patterns and suddenly now the, the visual uh, recognition system will think you are someone else. So uh, the main question that we will uh, uh, focus on in this talk is can we learn predictors that are adversarially robust to uh, uh, future unseen test examples? And also, how, how can we do this? How, do we, how can we learn such predictors? So let's start with a brief refresher of standard pack learning in the non-robust setting. So uh, typically, we have some unknown distribution D over a space of x cross y. Think of this as a learning problem of classifying, learning to classify uh, cats versus dogs. Uh, our goal is uh, usually uh, to find a predictor h hat that achieves small zero one error. So we, uh, we care about uh, finding a predictor h hat that uh, has a low misclassification error on future unseen examples coming from the distribution D. And more formally, if we have a hypothesis class H, uh, so this is a set of binary classifiers mapping from X to Y, we say that this hypothesis class H is, uh, is agnostically back learnable if we have an algorithm that can learn from finite samples from, this, uh, from the unknown distribution D, a predictor that uh, competes 
with the best uh, predictor in our class. So uh, typically in the non-robust setting, we just care about finding a predictor that has a zero one error that is at most epsilon worse from the best predictor in our class. And uh, in, in non-robust, uh, so this is the non-robust setting, standard pack learning. And we have a pretty good understanding of uh, uh, learnability in the standard non-robust setting. In particular, a classic theorem by Vapnik and Cherveninkis from the, from the 70s shows that a hypothesis class H is learnable non-robustly if and only if the VC dimension of this hypothesis class is finite. And uh, so this is a pretty like a necessary and sufficient characterization of when uh, that tells us when is learning possible in the non-robust setting. Furthermore, we also know how can we do this learning. In particular, we know that uh, doing ERM or empirical risk minimization. So if we just pick a predictor uh, H from this class that minimizes the misclassification error uh, on the training examples, then that suffices for learning uh, in the non-robust setting. And we also know what uh, sample complexity do we need. In particular, like the VC dimension exactly characterizes the sample complexity in the non-robust setting. But what happens when we move to robust pack learning? Uh, so first of all, there is a new component that comes into the picture, which is an adversary U that maps uh, points in the space X to perturbation sets. So think of the, the adversary U uh, as, uh, for example, there are famously studied perturbation sets that, that people care about in practice, like LP perturbations, meaning that each point in the space can be perturbed, uh, for example, uh, by uh, uh, adding a perturbation that lies within an N L infinity ball around the original point, or it could be an L2 ball uh, around the original point, or maybe just some other arbitrary set. So this adverse, basically, this is how we model adversarial robustness. Like every point in the space comes with an allowed set of possible perturbations that the adversary can choose uh, from at this time. And now, uh, when we compose this with the unknown distribution d over over x over the space of uh, x cross y, and not only do we want to find predictors that answer correctly on the original examples coming from the distribution, but we also want to predict we want to find a predictor that uh, makes correct classifications on perturbations of these examples. So, for example, here we would like to find a predictor that correctly classifies all the perturbations around this dog and also all the perturbations around the cat. And the, the, the perturbations are indicated by the, the green region. And uh, so our goal or our main objective changes into finding a predictor H hat that achieves small robust error. And, as, and the robust error is defined as the average over samples x, y drawn from the distribution d of the robust loss. So a predictor h hat achieves robust loss zero if and only if it labels every perturbation in the set of u of x with the label y. So if, if there's even a single perturbation that is misclassified by this predictor, then we say that this predictor is non-robust on that example. And so now with this goal in mind, uh, we say that a hypothesis class H is robustly fact learnable if uh, with, with respect to you. So notice here that this adversary U is known to the learner. Uh, like we know that, for example, we want to be robust against LP perturbations or L infinity or something else. We will later on in the talk, we will see other models where we might um, relax this uh, a little bit. But uh, for now, robust fact learnability is with respect to a specific adversary. Uh, if there is an algorithm that can learn from finite samples from the distribution D, notice here that uh, what we require from the distribution is a finite sample that is uh, unperturbed by the adversary. So it's just a clean uh, set of uh, training examples. But uh, our goal is to learn a predictor that achieves a good robust error, meaning that the predictor that is outputted by the algorithm, we want it to have uh, at mo be at most epsilon worse from the best robust predictor in our class. And uh, so this is what it means to robustly back learn. And now with this setup in mind, in this talk, we will explore three basic questions. The first question is, if a hypothesis class H is learnable non-robustly, 
meaning, uh, as we have said before, uh, if a hypothesis class H has finite DC dimension, does that, does that imply that H is robustly learnable? So this is the first question. And the second question is, does it suffice to just minimize the robust loss on the training data set? So uh, this is a natural thing that we have done in the non-robust setting where we do empirical risk minimization. Would this suffice as well if we do like the robust version of it, uh, would that work in the robust setting? And uh, finally, we also ask whether it's possible to construct a general recipe uh, or if we to have a general recipe to construct an efficient robust learner uh, when given only non-robust learners. So let's start with the second question. So remember that- so, Sorry, I've, I've got a small question about this. So yes. here, just to be clear, there is no requirement of efficiency on the adversary. The adversary can be completely unbounded to like anything, it's just- Yes, yes. Uh, it's in some sense a worst case, uh, like the adversary is all powerful as long as it sticks to its uh, predetermined adversarial sets. Uh, like it sticks to the neighborhood you. But other than that, it can do anything, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. And um, okay, so uh, remember that our goal is to really ensure good uh, population robust error. So we want to do well robustly on the distribution. So uh, a pretty natural thing that we uh, to do is let's just minimize the robust loss on the training data set. So if we have this hypothesis class H and we observe some sample S from a distribution D, let's pick a predictor H from the class that minimizes the robust loss on this sample. So as, as I mentioned, this is pretty natural. And in particular, we know that this provably works in the non-robust setting. We know that if we do ERM in the non-robust setting, this provably works. But what about the robust setting? Is this uh, is, uh, does this work? And there has been recent work investigating and working on computational approaches to solve this robust empirical risk minimization problem with a particular interest uh, uh, for neural networks. And there's also other work that um, argues for uh, robust generalization guarantees uh, for this approach by uniform convergence of the robust risk. However, if uh, people have shown in practice that the robust risk may not concentrate as well as the standard zero one risk. For example, here, if we train a standard uh, neural net architecture to minimize the standard zero one error uh, using SGD, and then we measure the, the, the train accuracy and a test accuracy on CFR 10, they, they are pretty close to each other. So there's like a small generalization gap. However, if we do a robust ERM, uh, or like a heuristic to solve robust ERM for neural nets. And we do this on CFR 10 with L infinity perturbations. Uh, people have, uh, have uh, like uh, noticed that you can minimize the robust error on the training data set. So you can achieve like close to 100% accuracy on the robust error on the training data set. But then if we measure the performance on a test set, the robust error on the test set, it's extremely uh, like uh, low. There's like a huge gap uh, in terms of performance between train and test. And so uh, this suggests that perhaps this approach like robust empirical risk may not work as well as, uh, as we hope it would be because like in the non-robust setting, things are fine. But then when we do the, the robust setting, there's a huge gap in, in generalization. So what is actually happening here? So the first result in, uh, and this is shown by work by Schmidt, Santurkar, Tsipras, Talwar, and Madri. Um, so we provably show uh, as an answer to the second question that robust ERM doesn't work in general. So um, like just minimizing the robust loss on a training data set will not be good enough for us to obtain robust generalization or robust learning guarantees. In particular, we show that there is a simple hypothesis class H that is learnable non-robustly. So this hypothesis class has VC dimension one. So it's constantly C dimension, but there is first no uniform convergence of the robust risk. So no matter how large uh, your, the training data set here as that we draw, if we measure the performance on a training set and a test set, there will be huge gaps. So like there is no uniform convergence over the class of uh, like over the predictors in this class. Furthermore, robust ERM cannot robustly learn this hypothesis class H no matter how large of a sample that you feed robust ERM, it, it can always give you a predictor that is perfectly robust on the training data, but it's non-robust everywhere else. 
And so like the performance on a test will be like roughly close to one or half. And furthermore, we show even worse, like no learning algorithm that is restricted to outputting a predictor from the class, from the function class H can robustly pack learn this hypothesis class H. And so here we have like a pretty uh, kind of a negative result showing the limits of uh, robust learning if we restrict ourselves to proper learning algorithms. So if we restrict ourselves to algorithms that output predictors from the class H, then uh, uh, like in general, we can guarantee robust learning or robust generalization. And so this kind of tells us that we need a new robust, um, like new principles for designing robust learning algorithms. So before I move on to answer uh, like the other remaining parts of the talk, I, I would like to briefly describe the construction uh, that we use to show, to show this result. So uh, pick uh, arbitrary endpoints in, the, in your space. And you can uh, use as an adversary, you can use any LP ball around, around these points. So L infinity, L2, all of these uh, would work fine. And now we will define our predictors. And the trick uh, that is behind this construction is that what we will do is we will shatter the points, these M points with respect to the robust loss. But uh, at the same time, we will not shatter the points with respect to the standard zero one loss. So meaning that this construction will have a property that um, uh, its VC dimension uh, of the robust loss will be arbitrarily large, like it will be exactly M because we will shatter M points. But when we, uh, when we talk about the standard notion of shattering, like under the standard zero one loss, it will actually be constant. We will just shatter one point. And uh, this is uh, how we get like an arbitrarily large gap between the standard VC dimension and the VC dimension of the robust loss. Once we have this arbitrarily large gap, uh, we can show after that, uh, or I will tell you to, uh, uh, about that uh, in, in a bit, but let me tell you how to do actually, how to do this construction. So pick any arbitrary bit vector. So the bit vector will be of zeros and ones uh, on the endpoints, okay? Now, if, uh, if the bit corresponding to, to, one, to, some, to some point is zero, we will define the predict, uh, predictor H uh, sub B to be uh, entirely positive on that point. So it's perfectly robust. Now, if a bit for a point is, uh, is one, for example, here X2, then we will define our predictor to be positive on the entire ball, except for a single perturbation where the predictor will be negative. And now um, this defines basically a, a predictor on the endpoints, the behavior on endpoints. And now when we pick another bit vector, if two, um, whenever we need to pick a perturbation uh, to define a predictor, we pick a new perturbation and label it negative. And so this way we will not shatter uh, like a lot of points in terms of the standard notion of shattering with respect to the zero one loss, because uh, we, we always label negatively new perturbation points. We always like label the entire thing positive except for a new perturbation set. Uh, I mean, a new perturbation point that hasn't picked before. And this controls the standard VC dimension, but uh, this, uh, this actually affects the robust, uh, v, the robust uh, VC dimension because uh, it doesn't, the robust loss uh, doesn't really care about which point you misclassify. As long as there is a single perturbation you misclassify, the, be the behavior on that point will be one, like you will be non-robust on that point. And so uh, I should also say that a similar, similar construction appeared independently in work by Kalina, Baguji, and Mittal. And now once we have this construction, once we achieve uh, that, once we show that there can be arbitrarily large gaps between the VC dimension of the robust loss and the VC dimension of the standard loss, then uh, we can prove that robust ERM actually needs at least M samples for robust generalization. So if you show robust ERM just half of your data points, like M over two, it can give you back a predictor that is perfectly robust, like zeros uh, on all the points, but it's non-robust everywhere else. And so it doesn't really generalize if it doesn't see the full M points. And uh, a similar uh, modification can be made to work uh, and to fool any proper learning algorithm to show also that proper learning algorithms will need at least uh, like uh, M points to do uh, robust generalization. And since M here was arbitrary, you can just take this construction and uh, generalize it to, to show that actually robust learnability is not gonna 
be guaranteed using any proper learning algorithm. So this is what I wanted to describe for this, um, for this construction. And now uh, we have another question, which is uh, like the first question that we started with. So if we have a hypothesis class H that is learnable, non-robustly, does that imply H is robustly learnable? And uh, so far we have ruled out the class of proper learning algorithms. And we said that uh, none of them will help us in general. And so does that really mean that all hope is lost? So is there, can we do something else? So surprisingly, yes, it turns out that there is something that we can do. In particular, we show that for any hypothesis class H and any adversary U, there is an improper learning algorithm that robustly learns the hypothesis class H. In particular, we, we show that if we output a predictor that takes a majority vote over predictors from the class H, then that gives us much stronger robustness guarantees. And the sample complexity of our learning rule is uh, gonna depend on the VC dimension of the hypothesis class and the dual VC dimension of the hypothesis class, which is known to be at most exponential in the VC dimension. So uh, putting together these two results, uh, proper learning is not always sufficient for robust learnability, but we can always do improper learning and this always uh, like works. I will uh, briefly now, uh, before describing the approach, uh, a sketch of our approach, I will briefly uh, give a crash course on dual VC dimension. And because I just think this is a useful tool uh, for people to know about, which you might find helpful in other uh, applications. So mm -hmm. the dual VC dimension, yes. Sorry, I've got just a question about something you, uh, again that you just said. So you're saying taking a majority vote, but what if like the hypothesis class is infinite? Is it like an existential statement or is it actually like you select a few of them and you take a majority vote uh, across a few it, of them? Yes, yes, uh, good, good question, great question. So yeah, it's not gonna be a, a big majority vote. It's gonna be actually in the convex hull of the hypothesis class H up to uh, like, uh, the, the number of predictors will actually depend on the dual VC dimension. So there will be exactly, uh, I believe, dual VC dimension predictors that, that will be in, contained in this majority vote. And yeah, so it's gonna be a, a bounded complexity, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, dual VC dimension. So dual VC dimension, think of this as just flipping your space while, where, where we treat predictors as points and we treat the points as functions. So for every X in our space, we define a function uh, G sub X that maps from predictors H to Y where G of X at H uh, uh, when, when receiving input H is just the label uh, of H at that point X. So this is like just evaluator functions. And once you define this uh, dual space, uh, the dual VC dimension of H is exactly uh, the VC dimension of this dual space uh, of functions, G. Or in other words, it's basically the largest set of predictors H1 up to HK that you can shatter using points in X. Uh, so previously, you know, with standard VC dimension, we talk about shattering points using predictors. And now we want to shatter predictors using points. And uh, it has been shown that the dual VC dimension is at most exponential in the VC dimension. This is tight for some classes. Uh, however, for many natural classes uh, like ha half spaces, for example, the dual VC dimension and the VC dimension, they're exactly the same. And for uh, neural networks uh, with threshold activations, uh, these are also polynomially related. And the, more importantly, uh, and this is the thing that we use is that we can actually apply classic VC tools uh, on the dual class. And this is the thing that will actually, uh, some of the technical stuff that will help us uh, in our proof. And so now I'll briefly describe a sketch of our approach. So uh, if you remember, I told you from the beginning that um, uh, the negative result showed that we can't rely on uniform convergence of the robust loss. So in the standard non-robust setting, this is usually the main tool that we use to establish generalization, the, like showing that we have uniform convergence over the class. And so ERM is fine and so on. But now, uh, like uniform convergence for the robust loss is out of the picture. And so we have to rely on some other tool uh, to establish gener robust generalization guarantees. And the tool that worked for us is sample compression schemes. Uh, sample compression schemes at a high level uh, say that if you have a procedure that when you give it endpoints, it selects a subset of the points, a finite subset like k points, 
and outputs a predictor that achieves a zero loss on the entire points. So in some sense, the sample compression scheme only sees a, a subset of the points, but then it achieves uh, like zero loss on the entire set of points. You can, if you have such a procedure, you can use it to establish generalization guarantees. And so this is uh, roughly the approach that we will uh, follow in, um, here. And uh, uh, I will just describe this in the realizable setting. So to remind you, the realizable setting is this, the case where we assume there is a predictor that is perfectly robust on the distribution. So there is a predictor H in the class that achieves zero robust loss on the distribution. And we will later generalize it to the agnostic setting where we, no such assumption is made. So the approach at a high level starts with the following. So we receive as input some training examples. And uh, to remind you, these are just clean training examples, sampled uh, S, sampled from the distribution D. The first thing that we do is inflate the set of training points to include all the possible perturbations under the adversary U. So remember, the learner knows that uh, knows the adversary U or the behavior of the adversary U in, in, in some sense like we know that we want to be robust to L infinity perturbations. So what we will do is include the original points plus their perturbations. And uh, you might wonder now, this is like, this can be potentially infinite set. So how can we, how can we do learning on some infinite sets? So this is where the dual VC dimension comes into the picture and where we can do some, some nice stuff about like, and discretize the, the set. In particular, we will show, uh, we argue that if we look at the space of uh, predictors that our algorithm will use, our algorithm will, re will rely on robust ERM as a sub procedure to do, the, to do the learning. And so our effective hypothesis class will be basically outputs of robust ERM on subsets of the data set of the training data set class. And so now if we look at this matrix, Okay, this matrix, the columns uh, are the outputs of robust ERM, or think of this as the effective hypothesis class that we are using for learning. And uh, rows in the matrix are perturbations uh, or points in this inflated set. So this, this is an infinite matrix. But if you look at the, better, the pattern of behaviors under the, the effective hypothesis class, this will be a finite matrix. Like there will be many patterns that are repeating in terms of the, the entries of the matrix, which are just telling us whether a, a column, like a predictor, is uh, labeling a perturbation correctly. So there will be many, in, in other words, for many perturbations, the behavior under the effective hypothesis class will be the same. And so uh, we can use uh, apply Sauer's lemma on the dual class to argue that there, there will be a finite number of perturbations that we should care about. And uh, it suffices to just minimize the loss on this finite set of perturbations. In other words, uh, there, we can show that uh, for any uh, uh, T predictors from this effective hypothesis class, if, the, if these predictors, the majority vote achieves zero loss on the, the finite discretized set, then they will also achieve zero loss on the fully uh, infinite set. And so it suffices to just find predictors, uh, H1 up to HT, such that their majority vote achieves uh, zero loss on the finite set. And so this is the first step of, uh, of this approach or the first stage of this approach. Once we have this finite subset, now we uh, use a boosting uh, framework to uh, find the predictors H1 up to HT. So how do we do this? We use uh, alpha boost or think of this as just uh, add a boost. Like any, any, uh, any procedure that does boosting uh, is just that alpha boost is convenient for us later on uh, for the compression schemes because it doesn't put weights on the predictors. It just puts uniform weights. And we will use the robust ERM to give us the predictors that we care about because this is the effective hypothesis class that we will use. And because robust ERM has the property that, you know, if you give it a, a data set, it will give you back a predictor that is robust on the data set. And we will have, we will be, this property will be useful for us. Uh, I mean, essential. And uh, so boosting, uh, what it will do, it will construct distributions on the uh, finite discretized set of perturbations, and then uh, samples a sample from this distribution 
sends a, uh, a sample to robust ERM. Robust ERM gives us back a predictor that is robust on that sample, and this continues for uh, 40 rounds. And a guarantee of, uh, 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 sorry, the size of the samples that we will use in each uh, boosting stage will be order BC dimension of the hypothesis class. Now, uh, a guarantee of alpha boost is that with the with number of rounds that is logarithmic in the size of the data set, uh, we will find predictors H1 up to HD, where the majority vote achieves zero loss on the discretized set. So this is, uh, since they are achieving zero loss on the finite set by the previous claim, they will achieve zero loss on the fully inflated set. And if they have zero loss on the fully inflated set, that means they have zero robust loss on the training data. And so what we've managed to find here is uh, in a finite number of rounds that depends logarithmically on the size of the finite set, we will find pre the predictors that, that compress uh, our training data set. And uh, furthermore, to improve the size of the compression scheme, so this is the step also where we use uh, dual VC dimension. Uh, this, this is the majority vote over T hypotheses, but we showed that we can actually further specify, uh, sparsify this majority vote by sampling uniformly at random, order dual VC dimension predictors from uh, the predictors H1 up to HT. And use it by applying like uniform convergence on the dual class, you can show, we can show that with high probability, you will get uh, a sample of order VC dimension predictors uh, dual VC predictors uh, that uh, such that their majority vote will also uh, achieve zero loss on the training data. Now, once we achieved zero loss on the training data, uh, notice here that we actually didn't use all of our training points to do to do this. Like we we managed to achieve zero robust loss on on the entire data set S, while only using order VC dimension times dual VC dimension points. And this is just by counting the number of rounds T that we did and the number of samples that we used in each stage. So this, once you do this counting, you'll realize that you actually, we actually didn't touch all the points. And so this basically gives us a compression scheme for the robust loss. And once we have this, uh, we can use it to uh, establish generalization. In particular, uh, the guarantee that we have is with uh, sample complexity depending on the dual VC dimension times the VC dimension, we achieve robust error on the distribution that is at most epsilon. And uh, notice here that the output of the hypothesis class lies in the convex tall of the original class. So it's a majority vote over exactly V star, VC star predictors. And this is, yeah, this has bounded complexity. And so this, uh, for, for the agnostic case, we reduce it to the realizable case via an approach by David Moran and Yahudai. But I, I will not go into the details of the agnostic case. And so this concludes uh, with these two results in mind. Uh, let's now kind of review what is known so far about robust pack learning. So in standard pack learning, we've seen that proper learning in particular using ERM, this is always sufficient. We don't need to look uh, 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 elsewhere and uh, things are fine. But for robust pack learning, uh, we have shown now that uh, proper learning is not always sufficient and sometimes we need to do improper and also improper learning is always sufficient. Uh, in standard pack learning, we know that the finite VC dimension uh, characterizes learnability in the non-robust set. So in this work, we've shown so far that finite VC dimension is sufficient, but we can actually have simple constructions to show that it's not necessary for robust learnability. And so one open problem here is uh, characterizing a complexity measure that describes um, or that is necessary and sufficient for robust back learning. We have one candidate uh, uh, that we propose in our paper, which we call the robust chattering dimension, and which we show that uh, lower bounds the sample complexity for robust learning in general, whether you have a proper learning algorithm or improper, but we, we, st we still don't have a matching upper band. And so this is uh, still an open problem here uh, for people who are interested to work on it. And uh, in terms of sample complexity, uh, relatedly, uh, yeah, so VC dimension characterizes sample complexity in standard setting, but in the robust setting, uh, we, we just have an upper bound in terms of VC dimension and dual VC dimension. And an open question here is whether we can improve the dependence on the dual VC dimension to something that is polylogarithmic, because 
that will give us at least something that is poly in VC dimension, or whether it's possible to entirely remove the dependence on the dual VC dimension and have just something that depends on the VC dimension. Uh, so these are the open problems uh, for this part of the talk. So now, uh, okay, yeah, yes. So first of all, it's been roughly 30 minutes. You asked me to, okay. to tell you. Okay. I, I've got two other questions, one of them being uh, very very dumb. So finite VC dimension implies a finite dual VC dimension via that lemma due to Asuad that you showed. Uh, yes. Is yes. the VC yes. dimension, uh, is the dual of the dual the VC dimension so that like also the, can we say that the VC dimension is finite if and only if uh, the, dual fine, the dual VC dimension is ah. finite? I, I believe so. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, but uh, I believe so, because otherwise uh, you might get a, yeah. I don't think you, they, they're always fine. Uh, yes, it goes both ways, I think, yeah. And the, my other question is for the, if we wanted to improve the VC, uh, like the dual VC dimension dependency to, to uh, something polylogarithmic means means that. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the issue? Is it the fact that if, for example, that back and forth was um, non-adaptive instead of adaptive, would that be enough to do that via union bond? Or is it actually uh, even that would not be sufficient? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so you're saying whether it's actually possible to do a non-adaptive version of this. And um, yeah, that's a good point. I, either non-adaptive or using uh, some techniques I'm not too familiar with, but like on adaptive data analysis to avoid, like to get something a bit better than having to pay a factor uh, yes, big T yes. instead of. Uh... Yeah, so yeah, so the dual VC dimension shows up in basically two places in our proof. Uh, the first the first one is in discretizing the, 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 the full set where like when we had this uh, full uh, set of perturbations, we wanted to discretize it. And the size of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, finite version of it depended on the dual VC dimension because we applied like Sauer's lemma on the dual class. So this is one part where we might like get a dependence on dual VC dimension. The other part is in applying the, the sample compression technique, which is, uh, I mean, the sparsification technique, because, and I believe that this, if we rely on this, then we can't probably escape the dual VC, the dependence on dual VC dimension, because it tells us that this is the number of predictors that you need uh, to sample out of the T predictors. Uh, perhaps there would be another way of doing this without relying on uh, boosting by perhaps maybe there's like a combinatorial way of analyzing this by saying just if you pick some uh, like subsets of the data uh, cleverly and then argue that the predictors will somehow make up for each other's non-robustness. So I think one of the main ideas here is that the predictors individually can be non-robust, but they are non-robust in different ways. And, and therefore they somehow um, like make up for each other's non-robustness. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for the questions. Um, okay, so Actually, I, can I ask a, a quick question? Yes, I, I just I just take from this slide right that that I guess uh, robust pack learning in some setting does not imply standard pack learning for the same setting, right? I uh, yes, uh, so yeah, but it is and, not and necessary. So my, so my, yeah, so my question was just going to be whether, I mean, I, and I guess I can see why that would be the case for your definition, but it still seems a little bit counterintuitive overall. And yes. I wonder if, it, if there's a natural definition of robust pack learning that would imply standard pack learning. Uh, so you, you perhaps with a little bit of uh, like restrictions, because the, the kind of the counter example here is that if you have a ball, uh, like an L2 ball, and basically you have a hypothesis class that chatters all the points inside this ball. So in this case, there is basically no robust predictor because like uh, your predictors are basically not constant on this ball. And like the best robust predictor in the class has robustness one. And, and so it's trivially like uh, robustly learnable by just outputting like a constant function, but it's not learnable because you can have distributions on the perturbations and um, so I would say like you could uh, perhaps with a bit more uh, like restrictions on how um, 
how you should uh, like we, like the class of distributions that you care about you would you might be able to establish the other direction like robust back learnability implies standard back learnability like if you don't have this weird pattern uh, of like shattering perturbations inside the inside like inside the small neighborhood okay thanks thanks um okay so the main takeaway from the first part of the talk is that adversarial training is not good enough by itself for robust generalization but it can still be useful as a subroutine which we use in our learning rule and uh, the perhaps also more importantly is that we really should start uh, considering improper learning for adversarial robustness and now uh, we will move on to the second part of the talk where we are asking whether we can have a general recipe to construct an efficient robust learner out of non-robust learners. So imagine that we have a non-robust learning system like a standard machine learning system where we feed it training examples and it gives us back a predictor h hat that achieves small zero one error. So, but with no robustness guarantees. So this predictor h hat may be uh, pro, uh, like brittle to adversarial examples. So the main question is that we ask here is can we learn adversarially robust predictors when we only have access to black box uh, non-robust learners. And why is this an interesting question? So the motivation behind setting this question is that there, are, there is a plethora of learning algorithms that are devised for standard supervised learning, but they lack robustness guarantees. And so it would be useful to develop wrapper procedures that can uh, guarantee robustness in a black box manner without needing to modify current learning systems internally. And that is, we are asking here, what we are asking here is whether we can have efficient black box reductions of robust learning to standard non-robust learning. And uh, when studying this question, an important aspect emerges regarding what form of access to the adversary view does the reduction algorithm have. In our work, we study two settings. In the first setting, we assume that the reduction algorithm knows the possible adversarial adversarial perturbations on the training examples. So for example, the reduction algorithm may know that it wants to be robust to L infinity perturbations. And so it knows like it kind of can figure out which adversarial perturbations to care about once it sees the training examples. In the second setting, we no such knowledge is assumed, but uh, we allow the reduction algorithm to interact with a mistake oracle which I'll brief, which I'll define, uh, but imagine like a, a mistake oracle is an oracle where you give it a predictor and an example, and it tells you whether the predictor is robustly correct on this example or gives you back a perturbation that that predictor misclassifies. And uh, so we just in investigate these two settings. And now I'll briefly describe our results in the first setting when we have explicit knowledge of you. So, the, here, the reduction algorithm knows the possible adversarial perturbations on the training examples. So uh, we, we showed that the answer is yes, it's possible to reduce robust learning to standard non-robust learning. In particular, we give a reduction algorithm that robustly learns any hypothesis class H given only a black box non-robust pack learner A for H. So if we just have a standard pack learner A for H, we can use it. Uh, uh, this, our reduction algorithm can use it to learn robustly uh, uh, robust predictors. In particular, the, the, the sample complexity of our algorithm, uh, our reduction is independent of the size of u. So think of, so size of u here is the number of allowed adversarial perturbations. Uh, it makes Oracle calls to the learner, uh, non-robust learner A that are logarithmic in, in the size of u. So think of the logarithm of the size of u is just the bit complexity of our adversarial examples. And also it has an additional overhead that is linear in the size of u. I should also mention here uh, that there, there is prior work that can be interpreted as giving a reduction uh, algorithm, but they require an, a specific type of learner. They specifically require an ERM learner rather than a general non-robust stack learner. And their sample complexity uh, depends on the size of u and uh, also the oracle complexity as well. They are both like linear, at least linear in the size of u. So this is work by Feige, Mansour, and Shapiri, and also Atias, Kontorovich, and Mansour. And uh, so when I present this result, I told you now that there is dependence on the size of u. So an important question here is whether this dependence on the size of adversarial perturbations is necessary. And we show that the answer is yes. So 
we give a lower bound showing that uh, if you only have black box access to a non-robust learner A, no reduction algorithm can robustly learn uh, with less than log the size of U oracle calls to A. So in, in, in a sense, the, the oracle complexity of our reduction algorithm is nearly optimal. There is a like a, a square difference here, but yeah. But the depend, at least the dependence on log U is necessary. And perhaps maybe this is not really bad, like this is weakly polytime, like linear in the number of bits uh, required to represent the perturbations in U, but, uh, and the sample complexity of our reduction is independent of the size of U. But what about the runtime? Like the runtime, we encountered a linear overhead in the size of U, and we, I will briefly show you why this is the case. But uh, something that I'm also thinking about, uh, or in, like an open thing to uh, for people to consider, is that uh, it really this this really tells us like what uh, like points us towards the question of uh, how should we avoid this linear dependence on the size of U, and uh, maybe something can be done when u is structured or maybe with some realistic form of access oracle access to the set of adversarial perturbations like what what sort of operations do we need to perform on u to to somehow escape this linear dependence on the size of u uh, in, in our work for example we consider a sampling oracle over perturbations but for now i will give you a uh, brief sketch of this uh, reduction algorithm the algorithm is similar in spirit to the learning rule from uh, the first part of the talk. And in particular, we will divide, I'll divide this in two stages. In the first stage, our goal is to build a procedure that when you give it training data L, so clean training examples, it, I want it to give me back a predictor that achieves zero loss, zero robust loss on, the, on this data set L. And notice here that we don't have, uh, we only have access to a non-robust learner. So we have to somehow use this non-robust learner to achieve zero robust loss on the data. And so we show that this is possible to do with this zero robust loss uh, procedure, which runs boosting under the hood. So uh, under the hood, this procedure does a similar inflation step uh, as we did in the previous part, and then constructs distributions uh, on, on the perturbations and gives them back to the non-robust learner. The non-robust learner will give us back predictors, and we can argue uh, using uh, like the guarantees of boosting that uh, after a number of rounds that is logarithmic in the size of the data set, we will find uh, a predictor that, that achieves zero loss, uh, zero robust loss on the, the input data. Uh, importantly here, uh, we, we output a predictor that lies in the convex hull of the image of the robust and the non-robust learner, we, we prove some results, the complexity, the VC dimension, VC dimension of this uh, convex hull. So it is important here that basically the effective hypothesis class used by the zero robust loss procedure is not very complex. And so uh, once we achieve this, so now we have at our disposal a procedure that when we give it training data, it gives us back a predictor achieving zero robust loss on this data. And once we have this, we can use uh, do another layer of boosting on top of it, which is the similar to the boosting that was done in the previous, uh, like the first half of the talk, where we uh, take uh, where we take basically training data, uh, we inflate them again, and then we construct distributions, give them back, give them to the zero robust loss, and they give us back predictors uh, that uh, that um, that are robust on, on, on these respective subsets of the data. And the guarantee is that with sample complexity that is uh, uh, equal to the VC dimension times the square of the dual VC dimension and a number of Oracle calls, overall Oracle calls to the non-robust learner that is uh, logarithmic in M and logarithmic in the size of U squared, the output of the, this robust uh, robustifier is, at, is gonna achieve robust error at most epsilon. So here we also use sample compression schemes to achieve robust generalization. And this is why the, the second layer of boosting is needed because the first layer just achieves zero robust loss on the, on the training data, but to, to do this and to guarantee generalization, we need this other layer on top of it. And so, uh, all in all, we have a reduction algorithm that just repeatedly makes calls to a non-robust learner and finally outputs a predictor that has robust error at most epsilon. Um, any questions uh, on this part? 
Uh, Omar, could you uh, clarify? Maybe I missed this. What exactly do you mean by the size of u? Like u, u is just a subset. It's a function mapping x to a subset of x, right? Yes. So basically, uh, the size, of, the number of allowed perturbations in that set. So if it's going to be infinite, it can be infinite. And so in that case, the uh, the oracle complexity will be also infinite, probably. Like, uh, so think of the this is the case where this u of x will be finite. In other oh. words, or or like uh, like how many bits you need to represent uh, to represent your adversarial perturbations. I mean, you could have like, for example, if your U is very well structured, like an LP ball or something, right? Yes. Then you can kind of uh, provide U very succinctly, right? You just have to kind of mention uh, how the perturbation works for every point. If it's just a ball, small ball, then it's easy to yes. represent that, but it's an infinite set. So that is true. Yeah. So it's easy to represent it, but because of the way the reduction algorithm works, like uh, you really need uh, to do the inflation step where like it's possible to kind of maybe discretize your, your set and worry only about a finite number of points. And uh, perhaps there's a way, yeah, to, to do this. But in, in general, if it's like an infinite set, uh, then you probably need like um, infinitely many calls to the non-robust learner. Um, yeah. And this is like, yeah. yeah. So it's actually like an upper bound on the, the size, the size, the inflated set, basically. Yes. Like how yes. much it's inflated? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, and another point here that like the so what really this points out to is like we should really consider like be thinking about how should we like what operations would be helpful for us uh, to implement like such a reduction without relying on maybe this inflation or uh, yeah without without relying on these things and so. This is like uh, in our work, we investigate like a sampling oracle. So if you have an oracle where you give a description of a distribution and it, it, it gives you a sample from that distribution, then you can somehow avoid avoid this uh, dependence. And uh, but yeah, but this is kind of a like a big like a general a high level question that I'm thinking about. Um, Okay, so with this, I'll I move a, on. yes. So yes. I, I had a related question. I mean, one yes. kind of related. So for the example of the LP ball, for example, if you know it's like that, you can take probably like an epsilon cover and just have like an exponential de dependence on the dimension, the size of u. But yes, the, the thing that was uh, I was kind of wondering about is the sample complexity here. So why is it epsilon yes. not epsilon square compared? Like this seems to like improve oh, okay, okay. over the yes. previous result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I forgot to mention that this results for the reductions is uh, just in the realizable setting. So uh, this is the setting where, uh, yeah, we assume that there is a robust predictor in the class. And uh, actually, the agnostic case is uh, still open. And Thank you. Like, we don't know how should we, uh, we, we don't know of a proof for the agnostic case that doesn't depend, uh, in, even in certain sample complexity, doesn't depend on the size of you. So, um, yeah, so this is an open question for people who are interested. Uh, I think this can be generalized. I mean, this can generalize for a Massart noise setting, but uh, but that's that's about it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. So uh, I'll now describe another model uh, where we don't assume knowledge of the uh, perturbation sets U, but we have a mistake oracle. So a mistake oracle. The predictor can um, like receives as input a predictor f mapping from x to y and some example, and the mistake oracle tells us if this predictor f is robustly correct on x, or if not, it will give us back a perturbation from u of x where the mis where the predictor misclassifies. So this is a more challenging setting because now the learning algorithm doesn't know what is the set of adversarial perturbations. It doesn't know whether it's it wants to be robust to L infinity, L2, or something else. Uh, all, it, all it knows is just this mistake oracle. And uh, first, we give a lower bound showing that even if you have an ERM learner, uh, it, it, that is not sufficient to do robust learning in this setting without at least like a linear in the size of U calls to the mistake oracle. And so um, this is more challenging. And so even with an ERM learner, we can do this learning. But if we have an online learner, for the hypothesis class H, then we can give a reduction algorithm that can robustly learn uh, with access to a mistake oracle. 
and with sample complexity and oracle complexity that are independent of the size of u. And in particular here, um, this is kind of a standard reduction of like uh, on, from online learning to standard fact learning, but it, it also works for the robust setting and avoids the dependence uh, like uh, on the size of the set u. And uh, an important question here is whether there are weaker sufficient conditions that would still allow us to learn in this mistake oracle model. So I feel like this model is more realistic because um, what we do in practice with adversarial training, uh, like uh, there is like this PGD attack where you find some parameters for the neural net and then the PGD attack will try to find perturbations and this continues for a number of runs. So it would be great if we can somehow prove results uh, beyond, I mean, like uh, results that, um, I mean, general results that do not require online learnability. And uh, in, in other work uh, with, uh, with Surbi Goel and Ilyas Diakonikolas, we show that half spaces uh, in particular are efficiently learnable in this mistake Oracle model. And we also uh, show that how do we can, can we in, in efficiently implement a mistake Oracle using uh, access to an efficient separation oracle. And with this, a summary of the reductions part of the talk, when we have explicit knowledge of U, we give a reduction algorithm robust that robustly learns any class H using a non-robust fact learner for H. And we also show that the oracle complexity of the algorithm is nearly optimal. In the mistake oracle model, we show that even an ERM learner is not sufficient to learn in this case. But uh, if we have a stronger learner, like an online learner, then we can achieve a robust learning with the, uh, yeah. And so a summary of the talk so far, uh, we have answered uh, the, the three questions that we wanted to ask. And uh, how, how much time do I have? You can, so you have like five more minutes, but you can take okay. 10 minutes. If you, if you need. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so to, to, uh, to recap, uh, we first asked whether a hypothesis class, uh, when it's learnable non-robustly, does that imply that it's robustly learnable? And we've shown that the answer is yes, but we have to rely on improper learning and that proper learning by itself is not always sufficient. And we also uh, show in the uh, second part of the talk uh, how in, uh, it is possible to reduce robust uh, learning to standard non-robust learning, at least in the realizable setting. And uh, the main kind of general direction that I'm uh, thinking about is, or that the thing that keeps coming up again and again is that if we want to have some for, sort of general treatment uh, of like robust learnability with respect to arbitrary adversaries U, it seems like uh, we should be asking like what operations on the perturbation set U would be like necessary and or sufficient uh, for tractable robust learning. So, and having a general treatment uh, can be useful in retrospect because now in many application domains, the right notion of like the right perturbation set is not yet like uh, known, like what is the right perturbation set for images or for speech and so on. And so this can be uh, help, it might be useful to develop theory that handles general perturbation sets. And uh, to recap, like open problems, uh, optimal sample complexity for robust learning, uh, characterizing uh, a complexity measure, I mean, developing a, a complexity measure that characterizes robust fact learnability, and also uh, generalizing the reduction results for a uh, diagnostic case. And uh, I would like to end the talk with a brief teaser on some other recent work that's gonna appear uh, in Europe uh, this year, uh, which is, uh, can we go beyond perturbations? So what happens uh, when the adversarial, uh, the adversary is not restricted to a perturbation set? What it can pick arbitrary test points? Can we obtain learning guarantees uh, in such a situation? And so the, in recent joint work with Chappie Goldwasser, Adam Tauman Kalai, and Neil Tauman Kalai, we establish learning guarantees with arbitrary adversarial test examples. In particular, we study a fundamental question, which is, can we classify arbitrary test examples. And we prove the answer is yes in the uh, transductive, under transductive selective classification. So I'll briefly motivate this with an example. Uh, imagine that we have uh, positive and negative uh, training examples. And uh, what happens when we observe test examples in this circle here? Uh, 
these test examples could be, uh, for instance, labeled negatively when the underlying uh, labeling function, the true labeling function is F1. It, they could also be labeled positively when the underlying true labeling function is F2. Both uh, F1 and F2 are consistent with the labels of the training data. And so here, there's actually no way of telling how should we label uh, these test points. Uh, but what we can actually do is uh, mark this region and abstain from predicting uh, on points coming from this region. Now, this is the main insight behind this work. In particular, we introduce a new model of learning called PQ learning. In this model, uh, there is an unknown target concept F living in a binary hypothesis class C, and the learner observes as input N labeled training examples, labeled with the, the label function, the, the true concept F, and N unlabeled test examples. The goal of the learner is to find a selective classifier. So a selective classifier is one which can abstain from predicting on some examples by outputting a question mark. And we want the selective classifier to have a small error rate on distribution Q, as well as a small rejection rate under distribution P. So we don't want it to say, I don't know on many of uh, examples coming from the train distribution, and we also wanted to make few errors on examples coming from the test distribution. It can also say uh, a lot of I don't know on examples coming from the distribution uh, queue. And this is kind of, can, can be necessary in some situations. And uh, the main takeaway is that it's possible to PQ learn if you use unlabeled test examples and if you also use selective classification. In particular, we show uh, like no additional assumptions are necessary. Uh, we show that we can guarantee few errors on Q and also few rejections on P. So the, like, the main result is we give an efficient algorithm called Rejectron that can PQ learn any uh, hypothesis class with finite VC dimension. Uh, the error rate uh, under Q and the rejection rate under P is gonna uh, scale as square root VC dimension over N. So N here is the number of training and test examples. And we also show that this is uh, tight, uh, like we prove lower bounds showing that this is unavoidable when P is not the same as Q. And as a corollary, if one is interested in uh, like uh, guaranteeing few rejections on the test distribution Q, this can be done whenever uh, Q is close to distribution P in total variation distance. But if Q is far away from P, then more rejections are necessary. And uh, so this is, with this, I conclude my talk. And uh, any questions are welcome, comments. Thank you all. Thanks for the talk. Uh, if there is any question, um, you can unmute yourself. Or if you want, you can keep your questions for uh, after, uh, once the recording is, is stopped. Um, so yeah, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions if you've got any. In the meantime, I actually have one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. So you mentioned online learning uh, as a sufficient condition at some point. Um, that's like yes. very easy, yeah. but like, is there any chance there could be a connection between this and private back learning for which it's been shown recently that actually um, online learnability was necessary and sufficient? Uh, yes, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that. And I think in the robust setting, it, it mainly, so this mainly points out to um, like the model itself in which we can conduct learning. So if we look at the mistake Oracle model uh, where you only interact with the mistake Oracle, online learning is sufficient, but I actually don't know whether it's necessary. And um, like in particular, we've shown a result where half spaces are learnable in this mistake Oracle model, but that's in, in spirit, it's really the same uh, kind of results um, that are that have been known before for learning half spaces in in the um, like with the with ellipsoid method and uh, like with cutting plane methods. So in in spirit, it's also sort of an online like learning procedure. And uh, so yeah, it's a good question whether actually online learning is is going to be necessary or not because I think that would be. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to know, uh, especially like the because this mistake Oracle model seems like a more realistic model uh, for for 
for, yeah, for practice. Thanks. Um, thanks. So in case there's no question, uh, well, thanks again for, for the great talk. Uh, I'm gonna thank, thank put us, uh, I'm gonna take us offline. And uh, if you want to hang out a, a little bit to, to ask questions after that, please feel free to. Uh, if I do so, just uh, again, our next talk uh, next week is gonna be by Shalef Ben David from uh, UWatalu on forecasting algorithms, uh, minimax theorems and randomized lower bounds. Um, and yes, yeah, so you can go on our website uh, to have some more information and subscribe to the mailing list for the announcements.